This short presentation is going to kind of go through the idea of bacterial transformation, which is a lab that we are not getting to do right now. Um, but it also gives you a little bit of background on why green fluorescent protein, or GFP, is super amazing and awesome. So, once upon a time, <laughs> there was a jellyfish <clears throat> whose scientific name was Aquaria victoria. And uh, like many types or species of jellyfish, a lot of them are what we call bioluminescent, meaning that they naturally glow in the dark and different ones glow different colors. There are many different adaptations for this, whether it's for mating purposes or predation or whatever it may be. This was a naturally occurring thing that happens. So scientists actually wanted to take advantage of this because there's a lot of scientific advantage to being able to make things glow different colors where we want and when we want. So uh, someone named Shimamura and Chelfi actually were the very first ones to isolate that green fluorescent protein out of jellyfish. And then they used it in science experiments in other organisms. And eventually, because of this, they won the Nobel Prize in 2008 for isolating GFP. Um, I worked in a lab with Shiramura, and I have met Marty Chelfie. Um, they used C. elegans, which is a tiny little worm, um, to track neurons over time using this GFP. So uh, there's a lot of cool things you can do with it. <clears throat> so one of the key features of GFP is that it can be used as a marker because it glows. So the idea is if you have a particular gene that you're studying, and this is common practice in science for scientists to maybe study one protein or one gene uh, and what it does and how it interacts with others over the course of their you know, many years of research. So for example, I spent five years studying a gene called APP and um, it stands for amyloid precursor protein, which is one heavy hitter in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I used this GFP to track when it was expressed and where it was expressed and all of those things. So the idea is that you have the ability to stick this GFP gene, you know, right smack dab next to the gene that you potentially care about. And so then what happens is it kind of gets tagged then anytime that protein gets made, GFP also gets made. So it will then glow green. And then wherever that protein glow goes, it will glow so you could actually visualize it in the organism. So some examples of this include on the left-hand side, you can see these are small E. coli colonies that are glowing green in the dark which was kind of the goal of the experiment that we would perform where we are using bacteria as little factories. The bacteria, um, once we insert the gene that we want made into a protein, for the example, green fluorescent protein or GFP, then they start to crank it out and make it. Applications of this include things like making other proteins for human use like insulin. We can use them as little mini factories. Um, in the middle, you can see glowfish. So if you go to the pet store, um, in the fish section, there's all different colors of glowfish. And really all that that is, is that they took a gene that happens to be turned on throughout the fish and attached GFP to it. So they are genetically engineered to glow green. It doesn't hurt them or harm them in any way. Um, and you can make them look different colors. And on the right is an example of that um, C. elegant worm that I was talking about. So this is actually something that I did in graduate school. These are my photos. Um, you can see, or at least this one is down here. Um, worms are transparent and I labeled specific neurons to be a certain color and you can kind of watch them over time and move and so on. Green was the first color, but by all means, it is not the last color. Since the original green fluorescent protein was isolated, scientists have really been able to pretty much take any and all colors. Um, I would say green and red are probably the, are, uh, like GFP and uh, M-cherry are the two that are most used 
but you can clearly see that there are many colors. On the bottom right is actually a picture of a mouse brain. Um, so it's a cross section of a mouse brain and you can see each one of these, it's called a brain bow, um, are different colored individual neurons. So you can see the individual neuron cell body and then all of the axons and dendrites that extend out of them. So it's pretty cool because you can then visualize and see in real time. On the top are different color bacteria that are fluorescently colored. So you can actually, you know, streak them out on a plate, have a little growth, and voila, you can make whatever image you want. So, other than being super awesome for nerdy science reasons, um, it can help you understand how proteins are made. It can help you understand where proteins are going in a cell. Where is their job? Um, how are they regulating gene expression? Meaning, when are they turned on? When are they turned off? Um, you can track cell movement. Uh, one thing that I did, which was really awesome, is you can kind of track cell fate over time. Um, if there is no green and then all of a sudden green pops up, well, that might be the birth of a cell. Or if you're tracking them over time and the green goes away, well, then that might mean that cell died. Um, so you can use it to look at development, um, formation of organs, and so on. Uh, you can also use it to um, identify what we call transgenic organisms. So when you're trying to genetically modify an organism, uh, sometimes we use uh, visualization of a color um, to go along with whatever other thing we're trying to um, insert. So for example, if I'm trying to you know, add a gene to an organism, maybe I throw in some color with it so that anyone that ends up glowing, I know got that additional gene. So that's kind of one way that we can use it also. So in terms of the experiment that we would do in class, um, we are using green fluorescent protein as a model protein that could be isolated. Um, we're using it because it glows green and you can easily see it. In common practice, this process would be used for proteins like insulin. If we're trying to treat a person with diabetes, we need to be able to mass produce insulin and then, you know, give it to people. So this is one way that we can um, use bacteria, in this case E. coli, as small factories to produce tons and tons and tons of insulin and then purify it to a point where it could be packaged up and sent to people. So just kind of think in the back of your mind as we're using GFP here, in common practice, it would be used with other proteins that just aren't visually able to be seen. So bacterial transformation. Once upon a time in unit one, we learned about three ways that bacteria can swap genetic material. We learned about conjugation, where they physically connect with a bridge and they swap a plasmid back and forth, and that's how we get superbugs. Um, another one of those modes is transformation. It's somewhat similar, except you don't need to form a physical bridge with another bacteria. Um, bacteria, in this case, suck up a plasmid from their environment. So a scientist is able to create their own plasmid or make it however we want, and then essentially dump it on top of a bunch of E. coli, and then those E. coli will take it up, and then they'll start to crank it out um, and make whatever proteins are on that plasmid. So these steps here kind of just walk you through what that is. One of the additional pieces that's kind of necessary is antibiotic resistance. One of the genes that's on this plasmid, as we'll find, is antibiotic resistance. And that's how we select for the ones that work. If our resulting bacteria are resistant, well, then the only way they could become resistant is if they took up the plasmid. Otherwise, they're going to be sensitive to whatever antibiotic we're using and die as a result. So it's kind of a quality control measure. And as an added benefit, since we're going to have green fluorescent protein on here, anything that lives and grows on the antibiotic should also glow green. So thinking back again, what is a plasmid? A plasmid is a small circular piece of DNA. And 
Bacteria can have none, one, tons, and so on of them. They are independent of the bacterial or chromosomal DNA that the bacteria has. These small plasmids can replicate on their own. They have a small thing called an origin of replication, and they will then copy them, their own cells um, independent of the bacterial DNA itself. I just discussed how they can move from one bacteria to another. Um, let's say one bacteria dies or bursts open, then that allows other bacteria to suck it up from the environment. That's transformation. Um, they can have antibiotic resistance, which is how we could get things like superbugs. Um, in this case, scientists are using it for a purpose of selecting the bacteria that were successful. Um, and in addition to green fluorescent protein, maybe instead scientists would use other genes of interest. This is the plasmid that is used in this particular experiment. The plasmid has its own name. So oftentimes if a scientist builds a plasmid, um, so I have done this before too, but you basically cut and paste and create your own plasmid, you can name it whatever you want. And then it can go into kind of like a database or a shared resource for scientists all over the world. So I could go on the computer and look up P. Floro Green in this case, and I could buy it already pre-made. So as a scientist, if there are genes that you care about that other people care about, maybe they have these already made. Or if you're just trying to make something glow green, you could just order this up and buy it. You don't have to make it yourself. But these are the key components that exist. So it has a promoter. A promoter is a small sequence that lives right upstream or right before a gene that you want to turn on. So in this case, we're going to be making GFP, which is the gene that creates the protein that makes it glow. So right upstream of that, we have a T7 promoter. And that's where polymerase comes in and begins to transcribe. Um, you can also see that in red, we have AMP resistance. So this is the gene that when expressed will make the bacteria resistant to ampicillin. So if we put the bacteria on plates with ampicillin, the ones that have successfully taken up the plasmid will become resistant and the ones that haven't will die. And then there's that origin of replication I mentioned. Every plasmid always, always, always has the, that and that's really the portion that allows the plasmid to replicate on its own. Throughout this thing, you can see there's a number of what we call restriction sites. So those are the specific unique sequences where restriction enzymes will come and cut if present. So if you remember, restriction enzymes are like the little scissors and there are hundreds of them and they recognize unique sequences. So um, if I wanted to edit this plasmid or cut it for some reason, this map is showing me exactly what enzymes I could use and where they would cut. The only thing that's not on the plasmid that's important to talk about is IPTG. Um, basically, this is the master controller here. It is a substance that is needed to turn on production of GFP. So it will not recognize the promoter and turn everything on unless IPTG is present. So if a bacteria took up this plasmid, that's great but it won't actually make GFP or make it glow unless the substance is in the food. If the substance is in the food, then the bacteria will glow. If the substance is not in the food, or in the food then the bacteria could grow. It just won't ever turn on production of GFP. So it'll grow, but not glow, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so in a perfect world, Bacteria will take up plasmids on their own. They just don't do it that often. And as a scientist, you want to help things along. So to do this, you can either use electrocution, which is called electroporation, or what we would actually use in this particular lab, heat shock with calcium chloride. So heat shock basically heats up and creates holes 
in the plasma membrane of the bacteria. So think about the bacteria as having a fluid membrane. And when you heat it up enough, it kind of creates holes. And the calcium chloride is a coating that neutralizes the charges. Because remember, um, there's hydrophobic, hydrophilic portions of membranes and um, the plasmid itself, DNA, is negatively charged. And so to kind of neutralize the repulsion effect of similar charges, calcium chloride neutralizes everything. So that way the heat creates the hole, calcium chloride makes it neutral, and then plasmids can be taken in at a higher percentage than normally would have happened. All right, so in general, the procedure is kind of like this. You take some bacteria, happy, healthy, lovely bacteria that has been growing on a plate. You allow um, one tube that doesn't have a plasmid as a control and one tube that does have the plasmid. And you incubate some of the bacteria with these two things. So one as a negative control is not exposed to the plasmid and one is. Then you take those tubes and you heat shock them. It's just a very short amount of time, like 45 seconds. Um, if you zap them in heat too long, you're basically gonna murder all of them. So that's not the goal. Um, but you heat shock them to have them suck up the plasmid. And then you put them on ice to nurse them back to health. And then you let them recover. Um, from there, you just put them on plates. So one of the plates will have nothing but LB broth or bacteria food. Two of the plates will have ampicillin, meaning antibiotics. And then one plate will have that ampicillin antibiotic and the IPTG substance that we were talking about before. So you take the one that was never exposed to the plasmid on the first two plates and the one that was exposed to the plasmid on the second two plates. And then you let it sit and then you would predict growth from there. So that's kind of the overall procedure of how that would work. I'll discuss the results in the next short video after you make your predictions.